The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholahungva. After being forcibly removed 100 years ago by the U.S. Army, the Nez Perce are celebrating reclaimed land in eastern Oregon. Last week, more than 150 Nez Perce citizens returned to the Wallawa Valley and blessed that part of their homelands. In 1855, the Nez Perce signed a treaty with the federal government for the right to their lands. But 22 years later, that treaty was violated and the tribe was forced from its 7.5 million acre homelands. Last December, the Nez Perce bought 148 acres of land in Joseph, known to them as the Place of Boulders. The land includes an area of the Wallowa River where the tribe caught sockeye salmon and the ridge where Chief Joseph once held council. COVID restrictions prevented them from returning to the land until last week when they conducted the blessing ceremony. The future is Indigenous Women, and that's the title of an award-winning proposal that just won $10 million. Two organizations, Native Women Lead and the New Mexico Community Capital, partnered in 2020 to apply for the challenge called Equality Can't Wait. They were one of four winners for the challenge. It was hosted by Pivotal Ventures. Vanessa Roanhorse is the co-founder of Native Women Lead. She says this award comes at a time when Indigenous women are leading at many levels. This $10 million investment comes at a moment in our history in which Indigenous women are leading and achieving at many levels of decision-making and power. We know with this support, we will not only continue to build meaningful pathways today, not only for our women, but that we can help catapult them forward, ensuring a new pathway, one in which we see Indigenous women and people at the helm. The organizations plan to launch a retreat space and use the award money to serve more than 3,000 women in the next five years. Mexico's Zapatista movement is calling on the indigenous population to vote in a referendum. They will be voting on whether ex-presidents should be tried for any illegal acts they may have committed. Indigenous people in the Zapatista territory of Chiapas are being encouraged to vote yes. Marco Jimenez, who is voting on the referendum, says he wants politicians to be held accountable for their actions. Well, the people are tired of all these politicians doing the same, and it is good for people to decide what to do with all these politicians, which don't do anything good at the end of the day. President López Obrador is pushing to pass the referendum and needs 37 million registered voters to participate or it will not be binding. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, a firefighter is using his talent for an art to help keep his mental health in check. And as Caitlin Onawa Boisel tells us, it's also a way to give back to his community. For more than 20 years, Craig Deerenwater has answered the call to duty. As a child, he dreamed of becoming a firefighter, but he didn't have any role models. I think as a kid, I was never around anybody influenced that was native that was had a job in the fire service. But his mother encouraged him. His other passion was art. Painting helped him to relax from his demanding job. Just set up in the kitchen where I had the best light, and I got back into painting. And I was just sit there all day, put my music on, start painting, and... To me, that was a big stress reliever. And it helped him deal with his grief when his older brother took his own life three years ago. I did art as a release to help me, and I did get back into it after that because I knew it was, it just helped me just to recover. And I did paintings of him, um, of his favorite football player. It just, it's helped keep his memory alive. And since then, he's found a way to help others. He's a part of a group called Fire to Fire, a peer support group for fellow firefighters. 
Craig found joy even when it was hard. And you know, I'm a first responder just like you are, and I know what you're going through. So I'm a resource that you can talk to anytime, day or night, you know, and we present that to them, you know, we get our name out there. And if you need someone to talk to, reach out to us. He gives away every painting he makes for free. One painting was for a coworker, and he told Craig it was the best present he ever received. Another was for his daughter, a painting of the lead singer in the band 1975, Matthew Healy. Right, because when I give you a piece of artwork, I mean, you're gonna enjoy it more than I probably ever would. And just giving it, it just makes it more special. In Oklahoma, Caitlin Onawa Boisell, Indian Country Today. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Dalahungva. Are you keeping track of the medal count at the Olympics? We'll get an update on how Indigenous athletes are doing in Tokyo. First, when we come back, we'll hear from Mary Catherine Nagel and how her work as a lawyer influences her passion for playwriting. Joining us today is Mary Catherine Nagel. She's a partner at Pipe Stem and Nagel. She's represented the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center and works on issues facing women. But today, Mary Catherine joins the show to talk about the plays she written and produced and how it's related to Indians and the law. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Well, I was intrigued, and not many people uh, in Indian country are uh, featured in the New Yorker magazine, but the New Yorker did just that, and it talked about how you're not only cited by the courts, but you're produced across the country. That's a pretty extraordinary honor. Well, thank you, and, and it's been um, an incredible last few years just to see, to see those doors of opportunity open at theaters across the United States. I think we're truly living at an exciting time because theaters are producing for the first time ever plays by Native playwrights, uh, which is, is definitely a new day. And I apologize for the dogs barking in the background. I'm uh, in the midst of a, a summer vacation road trip, and uh, I'm at my mom's house, and we've got two very excited Wheaton Terriers who like to join the conversation. Well, they're always welcome. L let me start with playwrights. Um, we lost uh, one of the uh, really early contributors to the theater this last week with Bill Yellowrobe. Maybe talk about his contributions. I think for pretty much any Native playwright who's writing today, Bill Yellowrobe was the pivotal Native playwright whose work was one of the very first to be published by any kind of mainstream press. He was the first to be produced um, in some mainstream theaters. And so I think for a lot of us who were looking, you know, when, when, you, when you start your work in the theater, you're looking for playwrights or actors or, or people who write stories that inspire you or are familiar to you. You're looking to see who else has already done it. And although we've had a lot of talented native playwrights over the generations, uh, storytelling is not a new thing for the native community at all. It's, but it's an ancient tradition we have. Bill Yellowrobe was one of the very first to, to really, um, to become seen and known and to, I mean, honestly, to, to, to make it. And he uh, had plays produced all across the United States. He taught at different universities and he really gave back to the next generation of native playwrights. And I think we all have memories of working with Bill, um, having conversations with him. He was incredibly supportive of younger native playwrights and, um, would oftentimes, you know, show up at, at readings or support people on social media. But he, um, I think for a lot of younger sort of people in, in my generation who have been just trying to get plays produced, um, Bill Yellowrobe was an example of how it would be possible to see that happen. And I think that um, 
for a lot of folks, I mean, he was the name on the bookshelf. And then, and then once you got into working into native theater, you got to meet him in person. And, and that was just as incredible as pulling his name um, off of a bookshelf. I would be remiss if I didn't add that not just playwrights um, it were influenced by Bill. Uh, he would often pick up the phone or send me a note. And it was simple things often like, I love that turn of the phrase. And to have somebody notice, of course, as a writer, you're always, wow, this is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he really, um, you know, he was someone who had a lot of connections throughout Indian country. I mean, in terms of, you know, his own tribal community, um, and then also, you know, where he lived in, in the Northeast and uh, did a lot of work in New York, but other native theater circles as well. And so he, um, you know, was someone who I think really understood the issues in Indian country in a, in a, in a, in a not in a superficial way, right, in a, in a very authentic um, way, because he he traveled Indian country and he worked in, in all of our communities for decades. I wanna go back now to that New Yorker piece. And one of the things so extraordinary is it caught, and you don't see this often in the mainstream, that you have this relationship with the law and the word and they go back and forth. Maybe talk about that a bit. Well, I, you know, I started doing theater when I was eight years old and started auditioning for plays. And I was Humpty Dumpty in Alice in Wonderland one year. And I always, always loved theater. Uh, I also was very interested at a young age in becoming a lawyer. And a lot of that had to do with spending summers with my grandmother and hearing her stories. Um, you know, she would always talk about John Ridge and Major Ridge. John Ridge was her great grandfather. And, and she would always tell me, you know, he was the first native attorney in the history of the United States. He and, and you know, Principal Chief John Ross fought in the United States Supreme Court in 1832. They won Worcester v. Georgia. We, I mean, you know, um, for my grandmother and for our family, these were huge victories in the Supreme Court and they meant quite a lot. And I think for Indian country, they're still huge victories today. I think, you know, McGirt is probably one of the most significant victories Indian country has ever had, but right next to it is Worcester v. Georgia. And I think the two do in some ways go hand in hand. And so at a very young age, I was appreciating the role the Supreme Court could play in upholding the US constitution and respecting the sovereignty of our tribal nations. And I wanted, I wanted a piece of it. I wanted to do that. It was to me a dream to become a lawyer. And I initially thought the two were not compatible. And a lot of people will tell you that, well, you can't do both and you need to just go to law school, forget, forget this artist dream and just be realistic. And I, you know, thought for a brief moment that that might be the case. And I went to law school thinking that I was being responsible and probably wasn't going to get to be a playwright anymore, but that was fine because I was never a professional playwright. It was just a hobby. And then I went to law school at Tulane and Hurricane Katrina hit. I, I was, my first year of law school was 2005 and um, the law school was devastated. New Orleans was devastated. Many people lost their lives and, and everything. Um, you know, beyond just a semester of education. And so um, it was a very devastating time. And when we came back in January of 2006 and the law school said, all right, first year law students, you just you just do two semesters in one and we'll get you caught up. Um, I think a lot of people really struggled with just trying to focus when people didn't, we didn't have some of us running water or electricity in our homes yet because of the devastation. And we were supposed to be going to class six days a week. And I decided to write a play and I thought the best way to overcome this trauma would be through theater and storytelling. And it was a huge hit. And everyone in my law school community said, well, are you going to do another one next year? And I said, sure. And then I did another one. And then finally, my third year, they said, well, you're going to do another one, right? And then I graduated from law school and I went on to clerk at a federal courthouse in Omaha, Nebraska, and ended up convincing the federal judges I clerked for there to let me write a play there in the federal courthouse about the trial of Chief Standing Bear from 1879. And we performed it on the 130th anniversary of that trial uh, in the federal courthouse in Omaha, Nebraska. And I think that the more I kept writing plays, even as a lawyer, the more I realized that the two are very interconnected and um, lo good lawyers, successful lawyers are good storytellers. Bad lawyers are bad storytellers. So, um, 
you know, I think it became very clear to me that that the two really uh, formed a, a, a symbiotic relationship. Well, and, and I always, and it's funny that you say that they're supposed to be separate because I always see them as the same, really. You look at Chief Justice Rehnquist, the late Chief Justice Rehnquist, and having his robe adorned like a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. Um, that's pretty extraordinary for a Supreme Court justice to say theater matters. Yes, and and many of them believe that. You know, Justice Scalia, before he passed, one of his favorite things to do was to go to the opera with Justice Ginsburg. Um, they often went together. And Justice Ginsburg, of course, is a huge um, theater goer. And uh, I was very honored to have her attend my play Sovereignty at Arena Stage when it was produced there in January of 2018. And living in DC, as I, as I am blessed to do now, um, and, and having a great relationship with Arena Stage, who was one of the, who was the very first theater to ever commission me as a playwright and to give me a, a professional production outside of our native theaters, which are wonderful, Amerinda in New York and Native Voices at the Autry in LA, who have been producing native playwrights for decades when no one else would. Um, Arena Stage was the first theater to um, non-native theater to give me a production and a commission. And I got to go to a lot of their plays. They would invite me to opening night of many other plays in their different seasons after I was commissioned. And it was, it was amazing to walk into that theater and to see, I saw numerous different justices show up for opening night of, of their plays. And so, you know, I think one thing I, I, I have learned living in DC is that, you know, justices on the Supreme Court, members of Congress, presidents of the United States, governors, every, every human being is a consumer of stories, whether they go to the theater, which many of them do, whether they watch TV or movies, whether they listen to NPR or watch Indian Country Today or watch Fox News or read the Washington Post, whatever it is, humans consume stories. And I think one of the one of the greatest things we can dedicate ourselves to as folks who want to work for progress is telling good stories and telling them well, because it does, um, a good story will change lives. But I really wanna focus on storytelling for the next generation. You spend a lot of time on that topic. How do we make sure that young people have opportunity? I think that's great. I think, you know, I know Creek Nation just announced that they're going to work with FX to give out scholarships to young Muskogee Creek citizens who want to go into film. I think honoring Sterling Harjo's work. I really admire the work that Madeline Sayet is doing at the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program, where they actually work with young Native theater performers and live performers to encourage them. I know uh, Madeline Sayet and Tara Moses are two Native playwright and directors who are working with a whole group of Native youth on storytelling and theater with Red Eagle Soaring. I mean, we have so many incredible Native artists who are working with youth, and I think that work is so critical um, because as we know, our culture, our traditions, our understandings are passed down um, from generation to generation through stories. And so if we want to continue our culture, we're gonna have to work with our youth and inspire them and encourage them to keep doing what we've always done. And that may be on TikTok instead of a theater. Or both. Or both. Or both. <laughs> Mary Catherine Nagel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor. When we come back, we'll get a look at indigenous athletes competing at the Olympics. This year, there are a record number of indigenous athletes competing at the Olympic Games. One person who is keeping an eye on the games and how the athletes are doing is Brent Kawi. He's the co-founder of the very popular website, indiansports.com, which covers native athletes. And he joins us each month to give us an update from the world of sports. Welcome back, Brent. Hello, Mark. It's great to be back again. Well, let's talk first about the big picture with uh, just the sheer volume of folks competing in the Olympic Games. Yeah, it's been a, a great Olympics again. Every year we keep having more and more compete uh, from the United States and from Canada and of course from the other indigenous areas of the world. Um, you know, we didn't have quite the uh, U.S. representation uh, this year, but um, we certainly had from uh, Canada and the um, Australian um, countries. 
Well, one of the U.S. athletes that uh, Billy Mills cited was uh, in surfing. Maybe talk about her. Yes, yeah, Sarissa Moore. Um, you know, what can you say about her story? I mean, she went professional in 2010. You know, she's a native Hawaiian. Uh, and, you know, for her to go out and win the uh, debut of the uh, surfing event in the Olympics is it's huge. Um, you know, for the island, because uh, I as I understand it, you know, they, she was allowed to carry in the, the state flag uh, that represents the indigenous people of Hawaii, as opposed to the uh, American flag when she was entering the um, the uh, the teams uh, parade and everything. So, to have a native Hawaiian uh, actually win the first Olympics uh, debut, um, it's huge for the community. It's huge for Indian country as well. And we should mention that it's a sport invented by Native Hawaiians. Exactly. And what, what more better person to, to win it than a Native Hawaiian? You know, just a great story. Well, and speaking of sports that are uh, indigenous inventions, uh, coming up in the future Olympics, we're going to see lacrosse. Yeah, that, that was a great. I mean, it's, it's been something that's been talked about for the past 10 years or so about making it an uh, Olympic event. Um, you got all these federations that run these lacrosse uh, leagues internationally. So the, the framework is already there. Um, the, the structure is already there. It was just really just a matter of making it um, uh, an Olympic event. Of course, you know, the next question becomes, are the Iroquois going to be able to uh, compete under their own flag? And, and that's something that uh, is a high probability that that will get to happen. Uh, of course, there's discussions and legalities that have to go into that. And, you know, as the Olympics, the next Olympics uh, comes up, uh, I'm sure we'll have a bigger picture, a clearer picture of how that's going to look for the Iroquois national team, which is one of the best teams in the country, right? Well, and that actually raises the question, as all the progress that's um, been happening on the field with athletes, at some point, there's also going to be need to be progress in the governance of international events, including the Olympics. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, um, you have Iroquois um, lacrosse leagues now in Canada and United States. Um, and just having that representation um, at the highest level, the Olympics, to me, you know, with the Olympics being the highest level, um, having our own uh, nations represented, have our own tribal flags represented, um, you know, no, nothing's even happened like that ever. Um, so it would be historic type of It'd be a historic type of event if that gets to happen for um, the Iroquois Nationals. I want to change the topic a bit. And uh, in the games yesterday, Simone Biles won a bronze medal. But before that, because of the pressure cooker and for a lot of uh, reasons, she wasn't in the right frame of mind to compete. And there are stories with Native athletes that are similar. Uh, maybe talk about that a bit, Brent. Every athlete goes through, you know, a mental block and, and even writers writers and journalists too and then you go through those mental blocks where you just can't get the words out or whatever but for athletes it's kind of the same thing um recently i spoke with a young lady um, um her name's uh, haley lunderman ellenberg um she's was a division one uh, softball player at, at Ole miss and uh, she was in high school she had all the accolades. She was the national Gatorade player of the year. She was the state Gatorade player of the year, the you know, Meridian star player of the year, just everything going for her. And um, she obviously went to play for Ole Miss her freshman season. And she was one of the top 25 ranked freshman softball players uh, in, in the nation at the time. And then the next season comes around here um, and she's not on the roster. And people are like, well, what's going on? What's going on? And I'm like, you know, I'm not sure myself either, but, you know, she's not on the roster. She didn't transfer. Um, and so basically having that conversation with her, you know, she basically said that, you know, she finally was clinically uh, diagnosed uh, as having a form of depression um, that she's finally talking about now. She's coming out of her shell. She feels comfortable about now. enough time has passed. And, you know, she went and played, uh, she did come back and play softball last year, one more year of eligibility she had um, at a smaller school. But, and now she's um, uh, on the waiting roster list for to play professional softball. But she talked about how the struggle she had from the time she was youth and high school and college, and she realized she just was using softball as an escape anymore. It wasn't something that she had a passion for anymore. Um, and she was just using it as escape to get away from her depression. But when softball became kind of too much pressure, because again, she was one of the top 25 players in the country for freshmen at the time, 
uh, it just kind of came to a head on. So it affects every athlete at every level. It doesn't matter, you know, how old you are, how young you are, or how good or great you're not. Um, it affects everybody, and you have to address those. Um, you have to address those issues. Well, and I think the key point is just how much of a pressure cooker it is to be in competitive sports where you're under basically a camera all the time and that pressure builds. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the pressure of the media. I mean, I try not to put pressure on our Native American athletes. I know um, as Indigenous people, we want to support our athletes, but I always try to make sure that when I'm covering an athlete, um, it's not something that I'm telling people, this is what they're doing every day, you know, every every day access you know I, I i point the highlights um which might be a week or two weeks apart but i want to end by asking you about moccasin cleats <laughs> yeah ryan helsey man what a what a phenomenal job his uh, uh an artist did in oklahoma for his cleats uh, every year's you know professional sports have um uh, causes cleats for causes and stuff and so he had some beaded moccasins made for him that he'll wear um when that um that weekend comes for the major league baseball uh, so that's going to be uh, a good experience for everyone to check out and get some exposure for Indian country. Thank you, Brent. Cool. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. This is Indian Country Today.